Hello and welcome to Artwork, a conversation with creative people about the joys, the challenges and the mundane moments of living an artistic life. We're your hosts, I'm Poppy Rose. And I'm Brie Robertson. And our artist today is Lisa Stewart, a multidisciplinary artist from Australia. Since studying visual art in Melbourne, Lisa has gradually added new art forms to her skill set as she's needed them on different projects. She now works across sound, video, installation, collage, performance, and energetic or somatic live art experiences. Lisa's art has taken her all over the world, and she spent a lot of time participating in artist residencies. In this episode, Lisa explains what an artist residency is and how they work. She gives us some insight into the day-to-day experience a residency might offer, as well as giving us some information on where to find out about them. Lisa shares with us the challenges and the benefits that come with working in so many different art forms, how she's learning to break down the barriers between art, life and self, and how important it is to be present in your body and your location to create authentic artwork. Let's dive in. I first met Lisa at the language farm when I started working in Germany and you were literally on the first camp I ever did, um, which was like my lifeline to, okay, I can stay in Berlin and I can make a home here. And uh, it was so lovely to meet you. And it's been really, really cool to see what you've done since that point. You say that you're a multidisciplinary artist. Can you tell Mm -hmm. us a little bit about what that means and what different disciplines you play in. How did your journey with being an artist evolve? The first formal training I would have had is uh, was at art school in Australia. I was doing a double degree with visual arts and actually business to begin with, which uh, later I switched <laughs> out. And then I think it was in third year, we had to pick a major. And for that, I'd picked photo media, which was mostly focused on photography, but also video art. Initially, I was doing more photography, but then when I discovered video, I was like, ah, video, it's like photography, but better because I can tell a whole story with this. And then I decided just the video world wasn't enough. So I went into installation. Um, And then actually how I first started making music was through the videos and the installations. I was making needed soundscapes as well. Um, and I think I just never really necessarily fit settled on a form. And I've always been curious of how to draw in different um, mediums. So it just kept feeling like as I would explore, I would discover a new modality and then get excited. And so I think initially I was like, yeah, I'm a video installation artist. And then I think I came to Berlin and I wasn't so satisfied with the visual arts scene here. And I found more inspiration from the performance community and that well, the performance community kind of found me in a way and then from there then I was learning more about live art I, I love just seeing what a new toolbox can give my art practice actually a lot of people that we've talked to in the podcast kind of focus on one thing and they they put all their energy and effort into honing mm. guitar or honing animation or something like that and I, I wonder like what is it like for you having all these Um, skills in your toolbox is it sometimes overwhelming or does it open up so many more possibilities for you yeah it's both like I I was just now thinking about uh, one thing I left out was after I'd finished art school in Melbourne I was mentored by a emerging arts festival next wave I don't know if you've heard of next wave but so they really encourage these like quite large-scale multidisciplinary hybrid art forms so from that I think I was working with, I was collaborating with another artist and a musician. And from that, we just didn't even know that we could outsource. Like we didn't know there was a word dramaturg. We didn't know we could hire someone to do our lighting. And so in the end, we were just teaching ourselves all the things. And then later it was like, oh, we could have had stage hands. I forget that I can ask others for assistance. So I just end up yeah, learning it myself. Yeah. I, I was having this conversation actually with a friend just the other day is that I think it can sometimes hinder me the fact that I'm very multidisciplinary because people don't know which box to put me in. So I know like other artists who are like, I just do collage. And then they're like, they've kind of blown up their collage thing, or I'm just making electronic music and they build that. And I kind of feel like I've got these different stacks. And then I'm like, oh, now I'm harvesting saffron. Now I'm making electronic music. Now I'm working with um, dancers. And I find a lot of people, um, because I'm switching worlds a lot, maybe 
uh, yeah, people find it a bit harder in terms of knowing how to approach me. But for me, I see how it all fits together. So I, I actually love it. And I think it's my strength as an artist that I can then bring different fields and modalities and find connections that wouldn't otherwise exist. After having a look through your website, like you said, there is a lot of different things going on. But having a look through, there's there's always like this same like energy which is you and you like you say you're bringing in all these different things that you've learned throughout your your journey so far and I think that that does really really shows and it really connects all your different pieces of of art in all the different forms thank you for saying I think every time I start a new modality like when I first started doing collage it was just because when I was making installations often galleries would ask for a promotional image before I'd actually made the work so I started making collages as a way just to be a kind of conceptual image for what I plan to make. And then from that, that grew into a thing in itself. But whenever I start something like collage or music, I'm always like, oh, no, but that's not my art practice. And then later, further down, I look back and like, but of course it is. It's still me. It's still my creative decisions. Yeah, it takes so much courage, I think, to get out of the box that sometimes you put yourself in or other people put you in with your art I know I've definitely I've talked about this before in the podcast but I really put myself in a box with my music and to realize that you can do more and you can do other things like at the same time I feel like you know you you balance a lot of plates um but that's awesome you know and that's allowed and that's welcome and that's that's an okay thing to do I think for a long time I was definitely in this mindset with like, I can just do music and that's all I'm allowed to do. But yeah, I just think it's so courageous to be like, no, I could break out of that box and do yeah. everything that you feel called to. I think that's so awesome. For me, it's really freeing because often when I start something new, like when I started doing music, for instance, I didn't know anything about it. And in that moment, I was actually very free with it because I didn't have these hangups or I didn't feel like I was known for that. Because I feel like when I've been doing something too long, I start to maybe my inner critic to get stronger and I'm more like um, afraid to maybe take risks and experiment within that. So when I go to a new medium and I actually know nothing, I can go much more into this state of play. But then I was also through weaving, I've learned a little bit about my, my habits with most things. Like um, I'm somebody that naturally picks up new skills very quickly in the beginning so it's like this initial learning curve of like when you start the weaving spiral it gets bigger quickly and it's like oh, I get so much <laughs> pleasure by seeing this initial growth and like yes I'm gonna master it but then there's a point where you're still going around the spiral but you can barely see any like change because it's gotten so big and that's mm -hmm. often the bit where I get a bit frustrated like I was thinking with my German learning, with learning German as well. It's like I do the initial bit. And I'm like, great, going to be fluent in a year. And then like it gets to this point where you kind of have to maybe really put in the work to get to this like higher level of, level of mastery. And that's maybe often the point where I can sometimes skip out and go to a, you know, zip off to another medium. Like it's a brave thing, but can also be an escape strategy sometimes mm. of like when I've reached a frustration point with a certain medium. But then I think also it's like something to be said about letting things rest and then coming back with then also new inspiration to feed into it. I've never identified my artistry, I guess, with the medium. Like, I guess some people are like, I am a musician or I am a painter. But for me, it's all just tools. I'm the artist and whatever I'm doing is, yeah, it's just something that I'm using to still chip into the same stone, but maybe from a different angle. A lot of the projects that you've done, uh, they they seem to be um, exploring just aspects of your life, or like you're you're kind of capturing things that are just happening to you, or you're expanding on what's going on um, for you. Like the Sahara video that you made of your play in the sand, and um, moments like that. I wondered how how inspiration works for you whether you are just constantly bombarded with ideas based around what's happening in your life or whether it is like a conscious decision of, I want to explore this idea or explore this theme. Um, well, actually, yeah, that's, that makes me realize that a large part of why I'm also multidisciplinary is that I really like to work in response to the situations that I find myself in. So for instance, if I'm, I find myself in a sound studio, I'm going to be making music. If I find myself in a really 
like a small room, maybe I'm doing stuff that's just computer based, but if I have a large space, maybe then I'm going to build an installation. And so, um, yeah, I think also my art practice, I really like to feed back, yeah, the lived experience that's going on around me as well. So for instance, the, the work in the Sahara was, I made that after I'd just been on a like six month residency in Morocco. And I remember when I first got to Morocco, I had been invited to be part of this artist collective. And in the first months there, I didn't even feel like I could make work because I didn't feel like until I could understand more of the outside world and how my place in it, I didn't, it didn't, I was like, yeah, okay. I could come here and just do my same collage practice or do my whole sound practice. But then like, what's the point? I like to try and really consider who my audience is, how they're going to interact, but also use it as a way of, um, I guess, mirroring back my own experience when I come into a new environment and trying to make almost the limitations or the obstacles, the challenges of the environment flip back and feed into the work. So it's kind of like a transmutation process. Your ability to create in such a, like a present moment and be able to go into new situations and be open to how, like open to the ideas and open to what needs to be made in that moment is so amazing like I don't think that's something I've ever really done I think I always kind of rely on my skills that have you know lifted me up in the past or um, ideas from what I've used that's worked in the past and I just really admire that openness. So you mentioned there that you did an artist residency in Morocco and you've done a couple of others all over all over the place Um, but could you tell us what is an artist residency? It's like a concentrated period of making work in a set location. So some places will, like there's so many different terms and conditions. Some might just simply give you a room and a space um, and you can do whatever you want. Some might want you to have an exhibition at the end and have certain terms. Sometimes you're living with other artists or not. But there's a whole network. I guess anybody anywhere can decide they start an artist residency. And then there's like these databases that you can put your residency online and the terms and some are funded by government. So you might even get a fee. Some are completely independent. So they might uh, want you to pay to go there. There's also a lot like that are kind of, I guess, money making businesses too. So there's a little bit of artist exploitation definitely in the mix with residencies. But yeah, I guess they're basically spaces that are inviting people either um, nationally or internationally to come. And you're like, when you arrive, you're then instantly put within a kind of a network and a community, which I think is the best part about it, that it's almost like a shortcut to being connected in a new location. Wow. That sounds so cool. So what drew you to start uh, looking into artist residencies and what was the first one? And yeah what made you think then, oh, actually, this is a really fun way to spend my time? I think it was just curiosity. I think I'd heard about them while I was in art school in Australia. And this was also before I had really lived overseas anywhere. And I think the very, I'm just trying to think, probably the first art residency I did was in Argentina, actually, right after I'd finished art school. And I'd been studying some Spanish at university. So I was curious to, um, go somewhere to a Spanish speaking country. And I think I just searched on the databases and found one that I thought seemed nice and made an application and then was lucky at the time I'd gotten some funding from the Australian government to sort of start my art career. So I was able to use that to go do that. Yeah. I think it was just maybe a bit like naive curiosity of like, yeah, I want to go somewhere else and get to know other art communities and exchange and see what else is out there because I guess, Brie, as you know, like the Australian art scene is quite small and and insular because of the the island location. And then I think also because of the colonial history, there's also this big focus of looking out to kind of find the, who are the big art icons. Like we're very much um, indoctrinated with the legacies of like European and American artists as the like top art. So I think it just seemed like natural that I would want to travel which I mean now my perspective is a little bit different on that but at at the time as a young like 19 20 something I don't even remember how old I was oh actually no the first residency I did was with art school so Monash University actually had a campus in Italy 
where you could oh, go wow. for your second year within your second year of fine arts. Um, I applied and they picked like 20 of us and we got to go and live there for two months. And that was just wow. amazing. I was so inspired. This was when I was yeah 20 and it was like the first time being, I guess I'd been overseas before, but it was the first time traveling on my own. And I traveled through Europe first and then was, um, was in Italy and my mind was just being blown by all the art that I was seeing here. And so I think that definitely made me like, be like, this is the best, like, yeah, you're not a tourist. It's a way of living in a, in a new place, but having a purpose. So you're kind of getting to have this everyday experience and you're doing your work, but in a completely new context. And I, I find it really inspiring. Yeah, that yes. sounds amazing. I'd love to hear maybe a couple of examples of different residencies you've done and maybe like what the day-to-day process kind of looked like. Yeah, so it's really, really different each one. And I think you, you kind of know the terms when you're coming. So like, so this first one, when I went to Argentina, I was in a small town called La Plata at a place called Residencia Corazon. And for that, I had a shared studio space with another artist. And I I think I was there for two months. And basically, I was just alone to make work. And the idea would be that I would have an exhibition at the end of it. Did you find that daunting to to know that there was a deadline? Yeah, at that time, a little bit. And because at that point, I was quite new to being freelance as well. And I wasn't that I was my first main year Actually, I'd had one year out, outside of university. So first I was used to university always kind of pushing the deadlines. And then I'd been involved with Next Wave. So that was like a, we were really stressed out kind of in the build up of that. And then I went to, yeah, and then Argentina. And actually, no, at that point I was quite used to having this kind of push of a deadline. I would say maybe now more I'm, I'm, I'm anti the deadline because I just really want to produce at my own pace and sometimes resent like, uh, being forced into uh, production mode if it's not if it's not authentic to where I'm at at that moment. Does that sometimes happen that like when you when you go into a residency there's there's an ex- kind of an outcome expectation that you need to produce something by a certain deadline and like what if you don't have any ideas or you don't feel like it's an authentic process? That, that can happen, um, but sometimes then it's a little bit more informal, like you're showing in, um, in a work in progress sort of setting. So I think over the time when I was in the residency in Morocco, we had a, a work in showing progress, uh, work in progress showing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in a way, it was actually kind of a nice push to make me have to bring my ideas because you can be in this kind of like exploring phase for very long and then to actually kind of come to it's like okay now this is the idea and let's share and while it definitely can create more stress it also then allows you to to understand the idea and you get through the sharing it with the general public some kind of feedback and then can develop it more so I think it's good but um also one thing I've noticed as being a like when I go on a residency and being an outsider I can often feel quite a lot of insecurity especially when I'm first there because I'm like who am I to even comment or to share in this context because I'm not from here and this isn't my like so I often go through a kind of (laughs) a moment where I'm really questioning everything I'm doing and why and and in the end I think then I do feed that into something nice and um yeah again try and kind of work with all these questions and not try to pretend like I'm a expert on the place that I'm in but more um take advantage of being more of a kind of outside energy coming in I can imagine that for for many people it's quite a daunting thing to try um but hearing hearing that like if you can embrace that and and use it to your to help you create maybe that's that's great. <laughs> also just remembering that it's a, an opportunity for exchange. So when I kind of think about it as like, I'm giving, I'm maybe coming with different perspectives that aren't known here and, and to share that and then to also be taking. So it's not just like, I'm going to come and take all the inspiration and um, it's yeah. Mm-hmm. Coming with like, um, like a conscious effort for reciprocity and also kind of humility and um Yeah, I think just having more awareness and sensitivity helps. Tell us about your um, 
residency in Morocco? Yeah, I mean, this was super special. And again, just one that came by chance. Like I think actually I would, I'd gone back to Australia. I was doing a really beautiful residency in, uh, at Watch This Space in Alice Springs. Uh, this was in 2017. And then a friend of mine, so a dear friend in Berlin, who was my housemate for a bit, had studied in Arnhem in the Netherlands with a dancer who's uh, half Moroccan, um, half German or, or French. And she has an art space in Marrakesh. And so it, it, it'd been like a kind of arts hostel. And then she'd had the vision that she really wanted to turn it into a um, an artist collective. And so this was like the first call out for that artist collective and so my friend just shared oh you know my friend's got this space it's really been her dream for years like that done I was like hmm should I apply I don't know I'm not sure but then when I was looking it was for a kind of a queer community-based art space um called Queen's Collective and yeah then when I was going through the application I actually kind of really connected with the questions and uh, then was really happy when they selected me, but also a bit daunted, like, shit, I'm going to go live in Morocco for five months. Ah, ah. But then I loved it so much that I, I ended up staying there. Cause I, I, yeah, it was, it was really beautiful. I was living in a collective with both local and international artists from all over. And there was about nine of us together in this old uh, Riyadh space in the middle of the Medina in Marrakesh. And I mean, it was definitely, uh, it was more like a, this very much bleeding of life and art. Like, I think while I was actually in the residency, I didn't really, uh, I didn't find it the best environment for me actually to produce work, but it was like just a, cause there was so much going on. There was constantly people visiting the space. Firstly, you were sharing space with all these people. So it felt like so much of the project was like, how do you make nine people live in a shared space harmoniously and then make work together and yeah so it was like lots of conversations and inspiration and then once I kind of actually got out of the space and digested then I felt like I started to make a lot more work but it was also just like this creating of uh of family so it was really like a lot of love there's nothing more bonding than the creative process so it must be so nice to yeah, for, form new friendships and form new bonds in those um, situations. Yeah, and I think community is a really important part of making art and it kind of, without it, um, it can be easy to lose motivation. Like, I think I go through two phases. Like, I often collaborate a lot with my in my practice and I love collaboration for the, like, uh, that I feel like you can realise things that are bigger than what you could realise on your own, but it can also be very intertangled. You're going into kind of quite a, deep relationship and often at the end of these collaborations you're like okay now we just need some space for a while so often after I've done a collaboration then I I really feel like I just want to do my own work and be solo and alone and isolated and do everything exactly how I want it and have nobody up in my business but then (laughs) but then after too long like that I can't stay in an ivory tower alone by myself too and I think it's yeah it's really you are stronger together and when you have other artists to share and appreciate and yeah support each other yeah definitely if there are people listening who would love to to find a a residency or would love to get started what would you suggest for them to do or where to look um well so there's this I think it's called resartist.org or something like this and that's got a huge database where you can search um by country or so I guess it depends if you're like you have somewhere in mind that you want to go or that you feel a connection to, or um, I feel like a lot of them also just come to me. I hear from people or so for instance, like I know the Berlin music board has a lot of um, residencies that they're offering as well for Berlin based musicians. And I think those ones are fully funded. So often, often the ones where they're fully funded are a lot more competitive. Um, But then there's also the option of like you, find a space that you like and maybe like in some instances it will be the same cost as what I'd be paying for rent so I think okay well this month I'm just going to rent my room in in this amazing location and do my work there or sometimes I've applied for funding um, from a separate organization to to cover that but I'd say just searching on the internet or um, I'm trying to think how I find out about them (laughs) ask other artist friends I think it's always nice to talk to someone who's actually been to the place you're wanting to go to as well to get a to get a perspective on it 
yeah. especially if you've never been to the place as well, just to sort of maybe understand a bit of what the challenges might be. And yeah, mm. but I don't know. I think I've always just gone a bit blindly and followed intuition and been okay with not knowing or that it might be a bit messy and yeah. I'm keen to know like what do you do anything to prepare for an artist re- residency like mentally or like artistically how do you get yourself ready to go into these situations for mm. months to in, to be in creation well okay if I was to do it all again these are good conditions like say before I went to before I went to Morocco because I knew I was going to be five months like this that was not a funded residency but the cost of living was like quite low but so I was I was trying to save up. I was in Berlin, like working. I was working a lot at the language farm. (laughs) I arrived there completely burnt out and it wasn't okay. Like I thought, um, yeah, I should have really taken some time, especially because I was living so close with others to sort of decompress and come in a clearer state in myself. But other residencies have been like softer paced as well. And I've had more time to myself. So then maybe I didn't need to kind of prepare but I, th- I think it's really that would be just a matter of checking in with myself or, or you oneself before you go and understanding what you need and yeah I, I couldn't really I don't think there's blanket rules because I feel like everyone's got such different systems and some people thrive off um, extrovert situations and other times other people more like myself really kind of need to recharge a lot alone before being around a lot of new people and new environments. In your bio, you talk about quite a few different themes that you explore, like um, exploring the corners of our consciousness from mass belief systems to everyday rituals. Um, and I've also seen a lot of your work um, in the on your website has also stemmed from coming from a colonised country um, from Australia and I I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about the themes that you are really interested in Um, because I I think something that has been really exciting for us doing this podcast is is learning that every artist has their little niche that they're fascinated with and they're excited and curious about Um, and I, th- I think it's just really interesting for, for artists and non-artists to hear that. We are researching an idea. This is one of the most difficult questions for me because I feel like I'm so close to it. It's like if you tried to ask me to explain my own personality, like I, I can't, it's me, you know, like so sometimes I'll come up with words and I'm like, yes, this is my interest. And then like years later, I'm like, that wasn't it. That's what wasn't what you were doing. But I think there is these common threads that I do constantly return to and probably have been since I was like a kid, I've always loved like uh, fantasy and storytelling and creating worlds and I think I just like picking I I mean that's what I love about art is because you can choose if you want to be a scientist or an archaeologist or a historian or like you can really play across fields and I think a lot of it comes from my curiosity of somehow like pulling back the curtains in the material world so how to like go behind and find out what's behind what constructs our perception of reality and our understanding of what's going on somewhere so sometimes yeah maybe I'm like with some of my collages they're more looking at this kind of like macrocosm microcosm game of how um, the self can be mirrored in the external world and how the external world mirrors the self and vice versa and um, so I guess a lot of it's autobiographical autobiographical (laughs) Um, because you know you can't separate I can't separate like I mean this is also the mythology of science that science thinks it's being objective but of course the scientist who's doing the like they always come with their own biases no matter what they're doing and so I think same with my art like whether I'm looking at yeah colonial like um, narratives around Australia so like for this work um, I'd been invited to have a show at the Australian embassy in Berlin and I felt at first I was like oh Australian embassy like I don't know if I can get behind that but then I of course I sort of as I do tried to flip the flip the problem into the content of the work so I then was making this like looking at alternative narratives to the kind of idyllic narratives of Australia that would always be kind of uphold held by the 
um, somewhere in like the embassy that just wants to show pretty pictures of like Uluru um, or yeah, invite me to their Australia day conference. And I was like, mm, no, <laughs> not, not going yeah. to that. <laughs> but so instead I built this big dirt, um, dirt sculpture of an Island that I carved out like an open cut mine. And then I'd put some yogurt in there as kind of a pun of the effects of, um, uh, white culture on, on this like ancient landmass. Um, and yeah, that through that, that became sort of a, a microcosmic event as well. I, they, um, then the embassy, I think asked me to remove, deinstall the work early because they wanted more space for their, um, Australia day function. So, uh, okay. Oh, you know, first, firstly, firstly, the, the yogurt started molding cause I wanted to leave something in there that was going to leave a bit of a smell when the kind of the people walked past. I'm just going to like put some yogurt. I didn't want to call it yogurt because the whole idea was that it was going to be mold. But they were also really nice as well. So I didn't want to be like, yeah, I'm trying to purposely stink up your foyer. (laughs) um, Anyway, so firstly, I think after about a week, they called me back because the yogurt was molding. So they asked me to remove it because there was kids that might have touched it or something. So, so yeah, firstly, the white kind of, uh, yeah, had to remove the white culture. Um, erasing itself and then later I was asked to deinstall the work early because of the Australia Day function and then um, the the dirt actually left a stain on the floor which I felt was quite appropriate which they didn't have time to be able to clean up the stain before the before the event took place Uh, in the end I think they buffered the floor and now it's not no longer there but I love that there's so many layers to that like the white culture of the yogurt and molding and yeah it's just so cool to get an insight into how you piece things together Mm. and draw meaning into the work. There's already also a soundscape that went with that, which I think was maybe almost my favorite bit where I'd had some recordings of the the lyre bird, you know, this bird that can imitate all the other birds, but how I'd taken it at Hillsville Sanctuary in Australia and it started um, making like machine toy gun noises. The the, the colonial impacts of, um, yeah, the white settlers is now being mimicked by the birds. So it's like even, even the birds now hold the, yeah, the colonial impacts, which I felt yeah. super strong. How has so much destruction happened in just 200 years? Um, I'm just always so amazed at how artists' minds work because I would never have, have looked at that lyrebird video and thought, oh, my God, that the lyrebird has learned sounds that it wouldn't have heard. like. 200 years ago so I, I I just think it's so incredible how when you are investigating something as an artist you start to see things um that you can yeah bring to light that other people may never have thought about before um, so yeah it's really really cool to hear your process thanks So in the bio that you sent us, you said based in Berlin from 2012 to 2017, um, Marrakesh from 2017 to 2018, and based in her body since 2019. And I was really intrigued by by the last bit of that being based in your body and that being your making that your home and your yeah your base really. And um, yeah, so I just wanted to know like what does that being in your body and being based in your body mean to you and why. Why do you feel that that's such an important part of your of your journey? Um, well, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> in so when I went to this uh, residency in 2017 to Marrakesh, I, I initially thought, oh, I'm going to come back to Berlin afterwards. Like I didn't see myself leaving Berlin, and then at the time I was having some health issues. Like right, I think the day I left, I had gone to the gynecologist in in Berlin and they told me that I probably have endometriosis and then throughout this process of when I was in the residency in Morocco all the symptoms I'd been having in Germany disappeared so I was like "Mm, okay there seems to be something here and then I also came back to Germany and had surgery and blah 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 but so part of um, actually why I stayed in Morocco initially was um, to try and take better care of my health after this, uh, after the surgery, it was kind of a wake up call of like mm, something with your lifestyle you were doing before wasn't working right. Um, but then I never really managed to reroute in, in Morocco and then never actually also managed to properly close the door in Berlin because, um, 
I guess like from a logistical point of view, being someone that comes from the Southern hemisphere, there's not like a close, I can't just like go and put stuff back at mum and dad's house and like move around. So Berlin kind of stayed my mum and dad's house. Uh, but yeah. to be honest, I haven't really then lived here. Like now I've, now it's the longest time I've been back here since I think the beginning of 2017. So I've just been back for four months without leaving, which is the longest I've ever not, not wow. left. I'm trying to even work out where I lived in 2019 and I was nowhere for more than two months. So I think I was, I was a lot in, in Chiang Mai working with a, a Tai Chi teacher for a lot, which also kind of came back into this, um, looking after my health. I was in Bulgaria working on, um, with some dancers there. I was in Italy a bit for various projects and things, then in Berlin a bit, then back in Marrakesh and then also in Australia. And so it was like somehow, nowhere so throughout these kind of this kind of mental year which was going to be continuing into 2020 if COVID hadn't come like I had this stupid I'd gone back to Australia it was meant to be for five weeks and then COVID started and I was like Poof. so I ended up actually living there for seven months which was amazing I haven't necessarily found where my my new home is so in this process I've just been like well my body is my home now and I've been really trying to cult cultivate a sense of home within my body that travels with me with wherever I go. And within that, I have, I mean, <laughs> I have like a special blanket that goes on my bed wherever I go. So wherever I'm in a hotel room or a friend's house, that's on the bed. Then I'm like, this is my bed. And I've got my funny little amulets or like kind of, I'm like a traveling apothecary or kind of fabric person that I was staying in my friend's uh, housemate's room. And he came back early and he was just like, has this girl been living here for two months? yeah, but she doesn't have a home anymore. Like this is all her stuff. <laughs> but it's my way of dealing with not having a solid base is sort of somehow taking these like crafting, crafting home wherever I am. Yeah. Uh, I really, everything you said just then like made me feel all warm and fuzzy on the inside because Brie and I also traveled so much in 2019 and 2018 as well. And um, for a while, like I didn't have a, a base in Berlin either. We would come back to Berlin after our tours and like I'd be moving into a different place or I'd stay on a friend's couch for a bit and it's just really unsettling and like disconcerting not knowing not having a, a place a physical space where you can set your roots and I think it's so I just really admire how you said then okay my the place that's with me all the time is my body how can I best look after this um because I think so often we forget that you know especially when, when we were on tour we were mm. not treating our bodies very well um with different you know chips and alcohol and things like this um but just to be reminded that it's so important to look after our look after our bodies because that is the only place that we that we know and that we have and also just the little things that you said like having your blanket I think that's just ah oh, such a yeah. amazing accessible tiny little step that you can have to to make a place feel like like a home for for a while and yeah, but it is also, it is nice to have a physical space where you can root down and yes. breathe and it's your own space. I think, yeah, because I've just uh, recently moved into a space like this and set my roots back down in England and it's just such a weight lifted off my shoulders and I, that I didn't even know I was carrying, you know. Uh, I thought I wanted to be this free spirit and travel all the time, <laughs> but it, it is nice to come back to, to home. And Brie has a song about that, which is mm. coming to my mind as, as we speak. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I just uh, think that's, I just want to clap uh, that. I loved it. I, you know, I thought I was fine. I was like, yeah, master of just my body is my home until actually having this time back in Australia and like feeling what it meant to have regularity again. And like, even just staying in the same season long enough to get like my sleep like was amazing <laughs> so mm. I, I just realized actually how much my body does want to just be in the one place and not be on planes all the time because that's not sustainable yeah. it's not great for the environment it's not good for the body it's not good for the biorhythms and like I mean now this year I've 
gone through just autumn and winter and I can feel my body just being like, when is spring coming? <laughs> kind of often skipping out on winter too, which I also don't think is uh, actually that healthy because I've also nice. now this year found my appreciation for winter and the beauty of how yeah. important this cycle is for shedding, for incubating, for sort of resting. yeah, doing the deep, deep internal work and resting, which actually now because of COVID, we actually have the luxury to rest a lot more and I'm winter in Berlin is actually wonderful when you allow yourself to rest I've realized I've realized how much I've needed it even though I was a bit nervous about staying here for the winter and of course I was really sad that I couldn't go home I think my body and my mind has just like embraced it fully and having you know being able to manage a routine whereas at the moment I would be staying at mum and dad's and how I'd be all over the place and I've really enjoyed kind of just having starting the year in my space and, you know, being able to have a bit of a routine. Our bodies need the seasons. Yeah. I also have to say, I think I've gained so much wisdom from going through the winters I've done in Berlin. Like it's not exactly fun, but you have to come to terms with a lot more of the inner cobwebs and darkness because I think an Australian winter as well, it's so short that you can sort of just push through and act like it's not happening. And before you yeah. know it, it's sunny again, where here it's like, if you don't learn to cultivate the the inner fire and mm. kind of alchemize more of the stuff, then you're just going to be in the shit. Like, and you're going to be sick a lot. So um, yeah, I've definitely learned a lot, uh, a lot more depth and sides to my personality that I didn't know existed before I went through winter here. So amazing how, how you just phrase that then with like alchemizing this this darkness and transmuting it into the internal fire I think that just sums sums it up so amazingly but I think that also takes like you say it takes wisdom it takes self-reflection it takes strength it takes knowledge and it takes so much to have that awareness of of yourself and of what you need has have you always been like really in touch with with yourself and like connecting and in, like listening to your intuition and um because it feels mm-hmm. like that spills through so, so much of your art but yeah yeah I was just wondering is was there a moment when that changed for you and you were like mm. oh like this is me this is who I am I mean I think I had it more when I was young and then there's something about going through the school system that um you pick up a lot of ideas that aren't yours and so I think then probably in my younger 20s I was more performing ideas of what society or parents or whatever had told me um and definitely my first winters in Berlin I didn't get it at all I didn't even know how to have a warm coat and I was just sick all the time because I was still trying to run around like it was summer this is this is the first winter where I've actually really fallen in love with winter and I'm slowly getting it and I think um I mean definitely the the endometriosis was a big wake-up call for me and I decided because like the solutions that the doctors here were giving me was like okay, now if you don't want the condition to come back, you should take this like hormone drug for the rest of your menstruating life. And I was like, "Mm." and read, read about the side effects of this drug, which was like weight gain, acne, loss of sex drive, like severe depression. I was like, "Mm, how is this a solution? It inspired me to go more into the root cause of these things and like take a more holistic approach. And through that, I've been learning a lot more of, um, ways of dealing with my emotions and, um, so I, I don't, it definitely wasn't something I learned when I was younger, wasn't present in my culture, in my family or anything like this. And it's been more stuff I've been diving into a lot more in the last years, which has helped me. Um, do you have any tips for anyone who's wanting to like get more in tune with themselves uh, just for themselves, like holistically or creatively as well? any practices that you do to reconnect? I mean, I think just um, listening to yourself, like opening up a dialogue, like the more you kind of start trying to listen for the voice and when it comes through, like just trusting it, that already makes it a lot stronger. Um, I also love automatic writing for this um, because it's something that like also in the last years I've been learning more about channeling and in the and as I've learned that I was like oh but I've always been doing this through my art practice so now I'm realizing that a lot of things that before I just didn't really understand where certain ideas or situations like all that was always coming to me like I would always have these strange coincidences of stuff falling into place 
but now I think I just have more awareness of how I'm sort of attracting or repelling certain situations towards me. So, um, yeah, I think definitely automatic writing is, is one that I find quite nice or, um, is that the same as um, stream of consciousness writing? Yeah, oh, yeah okay. I think so. Yeah, you just write or you can also write with your left hand as well. Sometimes I find that um, uh, creates a different uh, connection. Wow. Um, it's, it's quite yeah. fun. Yeah. I've, I've just started doing um, morning pages. Uh, at the start of the year, I started doing this um, – the program The Artist Way, one of the tools that I have never really done. I've always written a journal, but it's never been like automatic writing. And so now, like every morning, the first thing I do when I wake up is write three pages of just stream of consciousness. Mm-hmm. And I honest, I cannot believe how much it's just changed mm-hmm. for me. I thought it was going to be really, really hard. And how the heck do I sit down every morning and write Um, but it's become my favorite thing Mm -hmm. and it's just become such an important part of the beginning of my day. What I would recommend is that you find the way, like that everyone finds their own way because like you're ultimately the, the best authority for you. I think just like finding the stuff that excites you and like, yeah, maybe some people get inspiration when they're running or for others it's in the shower or I don't, I don't know. So yeah like each person yeah. is the one that's going to know how to find them for the, find it for themselves something i'm considering a lot more in the last years of this bleeding between art and life and how you kind of create an artful life as well and not sep- not creating yeah not putting things in boxes because i think ultimately an artist artist is a way of life rather than just like something you make and put on a gallery wall Is there any like piece of advice or a word of wisdom that you've held on to throughout your journey that you think um, others would benefit from? I think the main thing for me is just staying true to myself. Like there's been times where I realize, oh, okay, if I wanted to say follow this trend that I'm noticing in the art market, um, you know, like maybe I would get a little rush into, uh, into superstardom, but that's kind of not why I'm doing it. And so at the end, at the end of the day, I feel like I have to answer to me. So it's, it's really a lot about staying in my own integrity and not being afraid to do that. Even if like nobody else is liking what I'm producing. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, for ultimately it's like, for me, it's like trying to follow the the path with the most heart in it. And that's a really important, um, part of my practice for me, but Oh, thank you so much for this amazing conversation, Lisa. It was yeah, so my nice pleasure. It was really you. nice to talk to you both. And I hope we can see each other in person sometime soon. Oh, fingers crossed. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. If you'd like to be a part of the Artwork Conversation, we would love to invite you to join our Artwork Community Facebook group, where you can connect with the artists we've featured on the podcast and share your journey with a like-minded community. You can find the link in the show notes, as well as all the links to today's artist. If you've enjoyed this episode, we'd really appreciate it if you would take the time to subscribe to and review it so that more people can find us in the future. Your comments can help us pop up on more people's suggested podcasts, helping our artists' stories reach a wider audience. Podcasts are best spread by word of mouth, so if you know people who might enjoy this episode or the artwork podcast as a whole, we would love it if you told them all about it. And if you'd like to financially support this project, you can now do that on Patreon, where you can choose the amount you'd like to give us for lots of fun rewards. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook at art.workconversation. And tune in next week for another inspiring episode. Bye. Bye. Bye.